Hello, guys. Hi, Gavin. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, perfect. Hi, Steve. Hello. Just letting the others in. Guys, can you hear and see me okay? I can see you. Great. Looking great. Yeah, I can hear you fine as well. Hi, JB. Hello. Hello. Guy, you're showing oh, yeah. us up. You've got a tie on. And I wasn't quite <laughs> sure. I, I looked to see what the Graham West scarf was wearing in the late stage. I thought, oh, I better do something. So uh... oh, He's always a good yardstick. <laughs> Although yeah, I don't think I've ever seen him without a tie. Bit you were going to instruct us all to wear ties. So it's um, <laughs> two all. <laughs> I think, I think two we're, ties looking and two not. we're looking good. Well, all Stephen, good. you and I are on one side, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what that means, I don't know whether, you know whether that's a positive takeaway or not. Well, it, okay, guys, it's always assuming your side's going to win, right? That's every that's everyone in. So you're um you're you're all ready to go. Can I just remind you about uh, a mention of SPNL uh, and also could we uh, stick close to time? I'll take some notes of the session um, and type them up very quickly and send you a quick email. Um, and uh, I'm going to leave you now. So over to you, Guy. Thank you very much, Kevin. And. Uh... Good day to everyone who's uh, tuned into this uh, particular, really, I think it'll be a fascinating hour now talking about trade, the, the lifeblood of shipping. And uh, according to the latest figures of uh, the United Nations Commission for Trade and Development, goods at the value of over $14 trillion are traded or carried on ships every single year. But of course, uh, the pandemic has really altered this trade and the uh, shipping markets have been so volatile during 2020 and of course, we've had to contend with the crew change crisis as well, where our crews have been stuck on board ships trying to get off. But shipping has carried on delivering the vital fuel, the food, the medical supplies and everything that's kept the world ticking during this unprecedented times. But so much else is on the horizon as well from the sort of perception of the rise of protectionism. We've seen about Brexit and the additional sort of non-tariff barriers that seem to be introduced. And according to the World Trade Organization, 1.7 trillion dollars have been uh, of, of extra cost of trade since 2009 through the addition of non tariff barriers. So, where did that leave shipping? Actually, the International Chamber of Shipping, of which I, the Secretary General, were releasing a study co authored with the Harvard Kennedy School of Government uh, on the 24th of February that analyzes the rank of in, uh, policy, in, in protectionist policies of maritime economies. And whilst I won't go into details now until the full report is published, it's clear that reducing restrictions on maritime trade could pave the way towards turbocharging the global economy. And just looking at the UK in itself, the study shows that if the UK were to cut its level of trade restricted policies by 50%, this would lead to a real GDP increase of 0.7%. That's £13.4 billion pounds for equivalent of the UK's government annual budget for foreign aid pre pandemic. So there's plenty of opportunities and it's going to be really interesting to hear from the panel. I've got to by an excellent panel to give their view of their thoughts on international trade, uh, what how it's affecting their own company and where they see the industry over, over 10, the next 10 years. So I'm joined by, I'm in no particular order here, Steve Davis. Steve spent 12 years in the shipping services industry, most recently as CEO of the global maritime services arm of UK-based dry bulk ship owner, overseeing new world supervision, the worldwide trading of the owned and managed fleet of dry bulk characters, carriers and maritime consultancy services to ship owners, operators, investors and financial institutions. He's a member of the Institute of Chartered Shipbrokers and holds a LLM in maritime law and a BSc in economics. And also joining Steve is JB Ray Smith. JB studied engineering at Cambridge University. He joined the SWA group or just a couple of years back in 1985 and has worked with a group in Australia, Papua New Guinea, Japan, Taiwan, Hong Kong, the United States, Singapore and the UK. I'm sure many more places as well. He has led or been involved in making, with many SWA group businesses over the years and is presently chairman of United States Gold Storage and a director of several other SWA private uh, group businesses. He's also the director of the China Navigation Company and SWA Bulk, the Bulk Group's deep sea shipping businesses based in Singapore and Steamships Trading Company in Papua New Guinea. He has been a director of the Standard PI Club, 
Deputy Chairman of the Hong Kong Ship Owners Association, Chairman of the Lloyd Asian Ship Owners Committee, and a director of the Singapore Environmental Council. Huge depth of experience there, and it great to be great to hear his thoughts on trade. And finally, Arthur Richier. Arthur is the lead freight analyst for Vortex, uh, based in London. Prior to this, he was on the freight pricing desk at SMP Global Platts, covering dirty and clean dry, dry tanker markets, and worked in Singapore as a freight consultant within a shipping industry team. As part of the conversation around freight markets and their impact from energy markets to our everyday lives, he's contributed to Bloomberg, Tradewinds, Tanker Shipping and Trade, Ship and Bunker, The Business Times Singapore, The Houston Chronicle and Gulf News, amongst many, many others. In his spare time, he sits on the board of the Shipping Professionals Network of London. And I'd just like to thank very much SPNL, who sponsored today's session. And the SPNL brings together young professionals from all aspects of the shipping industry to network, socialise and learn more about this great industry we are proud to serve. So on that note, I'm going to turn to each of the panellists and just ask them their thoughts on international trade and where we see it for the next 10 years. Then we'll open up with some discussion and please do feel free to add any questions into the chat box and we'll try and get around to them. So turning to you, Steve, first, perhaps you'd like to give us your thoughts. Yeah, sure. Um, well, I think that you know, we're, we're, we're in a period where we're going to see quite a number of challenges and, and, and also quite likely a number of, uh, of great opportunities. Um, and I think, you know, given the, the, the macro picture that might particularly resonate to some of those people involved in, in dry bulk uh, as I am, but perhaps the, uh, the more, the, the meteor side of the, of, of the stick here really is, is the challenges and, and the concerns and, you know, that's really where where I'm, I have my focus at Anglo at the moment. I, you know, I think that it's quite likely that we're going to see a significant number of challenges um, associated probably with, with, with a poor performing global economy uh, in the period ahead and, and quite a bit of, of market volatility there as well. And, you know, it, it, we can all see that one of the main reasons for that is is the risk evolving from quite a significant quantitative easing program, quantitative easing program rolling out globally, which is likely to play out very differently across different geographies. Uh, you know, geographies where we are affiliated through our trade and in currencies that that we do our business in, and I, and I think that you know these sorts of environments are also going to to increase some of the risks around, like you've mentioned, the potential for protection, protectionist tendencies. Um, and that could present a, a real, you know, significant number of challenges. And, and, and it's important that any business is going to be able to mitigate the volatility associated with those issues and, and take on the, the opportunities that, that arise. So I think that's one area that, that, that's particularly on my mind for the next, um, for the next period ahead. Um, of course, delivering on our ESG objectives, it, that is a top priority. And I think that's probably going to be you know, in the list of, of everybody talking about the challenges over the next um, 10 year period, um, particularly with uh, an environmental hat on there, with an environmental focus, because, you know, we can all see there's no silver bullet for our industry. Um, so that evolving landscape is, is going to require quite significant um, management time and warrant um, quite significant management time. Uh, and then more broadly as an industry, you know, uh, contributing to how the roadmap needs to evolve in a way that, that doesn't undo the, um, the, the, the freedoms and, and the benefits that the global trade uh, affords. But, you know, at the same time accepts that this is a pivotal, pivotal pillar for how businesses need to, to plan forward and, and, and influence their decision making. Um, you know, those two areas for me are pretty critical for, for our planning over the next 10 years. Um, and on a more personal level, I think, you know, for me, ensuring that we've got the right value proposition as a company, um, not only for our, our investors, but also for our clients, you know, our employees individually uh, and for, for our supply chain. And that covers a number of key drivers. But this, you know, is essentially a, a time at which we can we hope we can build Anglo out as a, as a significant and influential dry bulk ship owner uh, with those key factors in mind. Guy, you're on mute. 
about that. Um, uh, I put it on mute because I thought I had instructions to do so and then I forgot to take it off. So I do apologise for that. I was just saying that the ESG objectives um, seem to be more and more up in the, the framework of companies' minds. And you can, you can only but think that there'll be huge societal pressure to build back better after the, this pandemic. And, and no doubt this will be at the forefront of people's minds. But thank you for that. So I'm happy to turn to JB and be really interested to hear your thoughts, given your, your long experience in the industry as well, the way you see it going and how, where trade is going over the next 10 years. JB. Yeah, Guy, thank you. Uh, Stephen, I, I'm very interested to hear what you had to say. Um, you know, I was reflecting on what to say today, and I thought, um, you know, I'd like to focus on what were, I thought, the main drivers that were going to influence what's going to happen to our business over the next 10 years. Um, and, I, you know, obviously, I, I don't think we have, uh, anybody here has the sort of um, the crystal ball to tell us. Um, but for me, I think there are four significant things which are seriously going to affect us. Um, and we've touched on them in various parts of the today, um, but um, they all, all in some way affect global trading patterns. And ultimately, what's probably most important for everybody around here, ton miles. I mean, I think these are nationalism, environmental activism, taxation, and, and I'd sort of label the new normal. Um, you know, I don't, we don't have to look very far for in Britain to see what the effects of nationalization do on trade. You know, Brexit's a great example. Um, you know, what uh, even a free trade agreement um, sort of creates a ton of restrictions through paperwork. Um, you know, elsewhere in the world, if you look at Joe Biden's efforts to buy America, or, you know, if you're involved in contracting, everywhere there's increasing local content pressure. You know, surely an indication that nationalism is becoming more important. Environmentally, you know, I see, you know, we all see the sort of increasing public traction to the idea that um, global trade creates pollution, um, you know, and by association, international transport um, essentially um, is a big factor in that. Now, whether we like it or not, I don't suppose the average consumer, when he fills up his car with petrol, thinks of the petrol as a symbol of global trade, but I'm sure he sees that as a symbol. I'm sure he sees it as a symbol of global trade. Um, but what I'm trying to get at is how long is it going to be before the dots get joined up and consumers start realizing that when, although we're part of the problem, we're a result of the problem, not the cause of the problem. And, you know, when this starts getting ingrained, um, I'm sure buying patterns will change. You know, temporarily, we've seen a, the pandemic has all of us, you know, I'm sure we notice how local shops are doing better than supermarkets, doing much better than they were before. And, and how many of these sort of, how many doors have been opened for local sort of commerce that aren't going to shut in the future? Um, the third point I think to touch on is taxation. Um, I think all of us behaviors are sort of heavily driven by financial incentives and disincentives. And post the pandemic or, you know, or at some time in the future, the governments are definitely going to be looking for ways to pay for it. And I don't think it'll be far down the long, the line that, you know, we'll be seeing extra duties or taxes that will force changes in purchasing behavior and ultimately trade. And the last point I thought to touch on is the new normal. Um, you know, I look, you know, I suppose a lot's been talked about the new normal post-COVID. What's the new normal going to look like? When will it start? Um, you know, I know a lot of us have had set a lot of store, no people or personally set a lot of store and looking forward to when it will be over. But what exactly does over mean? And when will we realize it will be, be over? And will it ever be over? You know, I think this uncertainty is going to create an awful lot of turbulence. And it seems to me it will take a long time before the volume of tra travel, for an example, reaches its pre-pandemic levels. We know this impact of travel has had a dramatic effect on global trade. Um, on the other hand, freight rates in most business, in most of our sectors, are very buoyant. But how long is it before the new normal is going to affect these trading patterns? And what's the new pattern going to result as it? I mean, if you reflect on 
what I've had to say, I think a sort of interesting fact is that before the advent of railways, nearly everything produced was consumed within 20 miles of production. So if you think that in 2019, the shipping industry carried 14 trillion tons of goods, like 14 trillion dollars worth of goods. So if all these factors drive a 5% change in that amount to buying locally, what sort of impact will that have on our business? I think it will have a huge impact and we should be start thinking about that. Um, but, and you know, while I sort of, have I got a chance? You know, I think earlier someone said today that, you know, we as a shipping industry have very little opportunity to influence those drivers. Um, but I do think collectively we have a small ability to influence how global trade is seen. You know, if you, I, I, I imagine many of you have heard the, the term flig scam or flying shame. And, and I think we as an industry have got to do is make as much as effort as possible not to, to be labeled with the marine equivalent of flig scam, um, which I, I'm possibly reliably told is called leaven scam. Thanks. Thank ahead. you very much, JB. I was fascinated. We'll, we'll come back to some of those huge issues you've raised. I think they're, they're really, you know, they've got the capacity to really affect uh, what shipping does in the future. But uh, my final panelist is, is Arthur. And I wonder if you could give us your thoughts uh, from where you're sitting. Arthur, please. Thank you for the, the introduction. Um, and also to the UK Shipping Conference organizers for, for having me here. We're really thrilled to, to be sponsoring this panel. Um, like Guy said, international trade is the lifeblood of, of our industry. Um, when I'm not helping the SPNL at Vortexa, we're an energy intelligence company that helps track um, seaborne energy cargoes. And this allows us to really see some pretty strong foretelling indicators when it comes to, to international trade. If we take a step back and think really of the, um, the definition of international trade, we've stepped away from something that promotes cooperation and, and the promotion of shared interests with something that's been used as a tool as a weapon um, in order to sort of uh, shape foreign policy um, as well as domestic issues. And, and we've seen that with the Sino-American um, trade war, where in order to sort of fight back at practices, business practices, which were deemed unfair by, by the previous US administration and the desire as well to sort of help the, the US agriculture industry, um, this trade war occurred and these, these tariffs were, were put in place. But overall, this sort of attitude doesn't help doesn't help shipping it doesn't help um, our industry there's a lot of things we can touch upon um especially in what jb just um just said locally as well uh it's a very controversial topic whether brexit will sort of help trade by removing um unnecessary administrative steps or whether it will hamper it by taking a step away from an existing trade union um, and a block um which is already cooperating now, coming from the, the tanker industry, it's been a wild year. And I was already saying this last year after we've had a, a spike of rates following US sanctions on, on Chinese tonnage, for example, attacks in the, in the Middle East. And I was already saying back in the day how these are really black swans, um, once in a generation events. Um, and this year has proven that black swans have, have sort of become the norm. Um, just as a reminder, about a year ago in March, the tanker industry find itself in the middle of a price war between two of the world's largest uh, producers, Russia and Saudi Arabia, and at the same time, a de collapse in, um, in demand. So it was sort of the perfect storm there with tankers uh, becoming in demand and rates hitting records um, as traders sought to sort of benefit from this contango structure and, and put that cheap oil and store it offshore. But it's become a double-edged sword now because We've seen Saudi Arabia and other OPEC countries um, cut supply in order to help the, the oil price recover. But demand hasn't, hasn't followed. Um, some people estimate that demand won't recover until 2023. And not only is the tanker market sort of in the doldrums right now because of that, but all the tankers that come out of floating storage are just adding to, to that problem of, of overcapacity, of over tonnage that the industry has been facing for, for a while. Um, I think when it comes to, to sort of protectionism and 
how there'll be a lot more local consumption, that's definitely going to impact the, the tanker trade. Um, we estimate that town miles will decrease. If you look at the example of Nigeria, now they're one of the world's largest producers of, of crude, but they import a tremendous amount of, of refined products, such as gasoline from, from Europe. Well, they're building the world's largest refinery there at the moment in order to sort of cater to, to their own supply needs. And that's going to have an impact not only on, um, on refined product ton miles there, um, but also in terms of the consumption, probably for the, for the rest of the region. Just a smaller point to, to touch upon when it comes to, to the energy transition. For it to happen in the industry, and I'm sure we'll talk about it in more detail during this panel, um, it's going to have to be profitable. And I think that's something which is really the, the biggest challenge, is the shipping industry can't afford to, to be loss-making, sort of test new technologies. Um, it's not like government supporting solar panels in certain European countries or renewable technology. Um, and putting a lot of money there in terms of subsidies. There's no one who's out there willing to, to give that much money to, to the shipping industry. And we're talking about considerable amounts. I think Shell estimated um, through a great report on the decarbonization of shipping that it was gonna cost $1.65 trillion to really sort of make that transition happen, um, encompassing everything from the infrastructure needed to, to the sort of research and development. Um, so that's definitely one of the, the biggest challenge, challenges as well. But I'm sure we'll dive into some of these points um, in more detail with sort of the wealth and, and expertise uh, we have here on this panel. And I'll close my, my opening remarks. Thanks, Arthur. I would be controversial, I suppose, now. Is there, with all what you said, is there actually a future for the tanker industry in the, the next 10 years? <laughs> um, I mean, what this question implies is that seaborne energy flows will look very different from what they look like today um, and i think that's perfectly fine you know without it meaning the death of the the tanker industry but more its evolution in a, in a structural way from from where it is today yes there'll be more energy or let's say a greater portion of the energy mix will come from electricity and renewables um, and that will be locally produced in the in the majority of the cases but i foresee our energy needs to still continue growing uh, petrochemicals will remain a part of the, the fabric of our industrial and, and consumer needs, and that won't go away anytime soon. Um, and we, we've seen sustainable technology and fuels such as hydrogen, for example, um, really sort of up and coming a lot more in the, in the different conversations. And not all country will be able to, to produce it locally. So we might see more of these facilities pop up around the world and sort of replace the, the crude oil trade that, that we have today. We're expecting any day now the first um, hydrogen carrier to sell to, to Australia to pick up its first cargo um, from Australia to, to Japan. And this would sort of offer a glimpse into the, the tanker industry of the future. Thank you, thank you. It's interesting that the CEO of Shell reckoned that um, he's, they peaked production in terms of Shell in terms of fossil fuel or oil in 2019. So it's certainly some uh, exciting times ahead, as you say. But I'll put it to you, maybe, GB. I was really interested in your thoughts on, on globalization. Do you, are you really seeing signs of this now? Do you think that localization or regionalization will, will really change shipping patterns going forward? Are we, are we, you know, is that going to affect our industry uh, significantly, do you feel, in the next few years? I don't have a crystal ball, um, but I, 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 I think all the drivers out there are saying, go local, go regional. Um, you know, I, I just don't see that. Uh, you know, I, I see that you know, people are going to begin to understand that buying something that was produced in Australia and used in Cumbria just doesn't make sense anymore. Um, and um, you know, eating I mean, in New Zealand butter in Dundee just probably doesn't make sense. And we should be using butter that's made somewhere in England or somewhere in Scotland or somewhere in Ireland. And I think those that that has to have an impact. Um, and I just go back to the thought that, you know, before the railways, you know, stuff couldn't be transported anywhere. So everybody survived on stuff that was, you know, could be effectively carried by horse and cart a reasonable distance. 
and, and, and I think that that is going to be an effect on, on, on our business. Thanks, Kevin. Steve, did you have a, a comment on that? Your, your thoughts from, from, from where you sit in the industry? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the, the pretty wonderful realizations that a lot of us have had through this period is, is that, you know, perhaps globalization and, and global trade needn't mean the death of a local or regional community or, or enterprise. I think that it's an actual, you know, it's a real positive, I think, that hopefully people are taking away from it. It's definitely created some questions for us as to the, um, the efficiency of supply chains and production models. And I think that that could, like JB says, see some more um, some some real benefits of regional production. And, and I'm sure that you know, in terms of how that impacts sectors of the shipping industry, you know, quite quite evidently, if if consumer and the secondary products are consumed closer to the uh, oh, sorry produced closer to their consumption, then that will likely impact um, sectors such as the container market, for example. That could that could really be an impact if this is a, a true trend in that direction. But uh, you know, um, I take it to dry bulk, which is where which is where Anglo is is more involved, of course. And you know, during this period, I've I've, I've made friends with a with a chap that's uh, that's down at the local allotments here through lockdown. But unless he can create a microclimate to grow sugar cane, I don't imagine that dry bulk shipping is going to be that 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 big impacted. But you know, there are other sec sec sectors that may be more impacted than than some. Thank you. I, I've seen that there's a, a Morris story. Morris was asking about the container trade. And of course, we've seen absolutely massive spikes in rates for the container industry. And as people in lockdown seem to be ordering loads of stuff on Amazon or whatever it is, does that sort of put a, a, a bit of a lie to that sort of that localization, that regionalization? Maybe Arthur, you've got a comment on, on, on that. It's a, it's a really interesting topic because. You know, I believe specifically within the current context of the the pandemic, um, globalization is well and truly alive. If we if we did by which businesses develop on an international scale, the fact that we were able to move so many things online, um, and even for the physical businesses that weren't necessarily operating within the online space, they've used that space to to communicate, um, and we've had this sort of flawless communication without borders. Um, and as such, maybe globalization is expressing itself or has been accelerated in its sort of, of purest form. But in the context of shipping, um, I'd like to echo what, what Stephen said. And this is why it's great to have people from different um, areas of the industry. Maybe container trays, maybe specific types of products, you know, will be more locally produced. Um, but some simply, simply can't be replaced. Um, if you look at the, the consumption, once more in my industry that, that China has of, of crude oil, um, then might not be able to, to find that much in order to meet their energy needs, however many solar panels they build or how many you know, wind turbines they, they invest in. Um, so will there be a reduction in shipping you know, due to a more localized consumption? Um, I believe yes. At the same time, I don't think the majority will disappear purely because some trade routes are, are here to stay for now. Thanks, Thanks Arthur. And perhaps if we want to, we, we talk. Guy, yeah. I, I think I just, I, I, I think I, I wanted to draw an observation. It's, what I'm trying to, to point out is that, you know, our shipping industry has, you know, it's been relatively cheap in the past to add capacity. And we, we've always been a business in whatever sector where at least supply matches demand, you know, very close to it. Um, and when freight rates go down, supply more than exceeds demand. Um, and what I see is that even with relatively small changes in global trade, we will see big impact on our businesses. And where those demands reduce, we'll have a lot of excess capacity. And I suppose that's the point where I'm coming from. Is is not so much it says no global trade, is that before we needed 100 ships, but now we only need 92, and we know what the result for our industry is when that happens. And how long does it take for for supply to return to 92? Well, having been through quite a few down cycles in my life, it takes a while. Mm -hmm. 
Thanks. Yeah, it's, but it's also interesting. I think you said it in your opening remarks, as, as this, uh, Arthur did as well, and and so did Steve. This this ESG, this absolute transition to new fuels and new technology, and the COP is how is that going to impact on 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 environmental considerations? How are we going to? Who's going to pay for that six point five trillion dollar investment? And how? Um, the fact that we're going to be competing with these new fuels with just about every other sector at the moment we sort of tend to burn the, the, the oil that nobody else wants but how are we going to compete and how is that what we think that will fundamentally change the, the shipping business model you know from the low carbon from this move to new technology and, and you know who, who would like to sort of venture a thought on that for well i'm happy to venture a thought yeah um, you know if for instance, you know, container lines today, some container lines are making record profits. You know, with that sort of money, of course we can afford to pay for it. Um, and we should. But if, if supply, if demand, if, if demand is not met by, if supply is well over demand, then we won't be able to afford it. Um, Steve, what's your, your thoughts? You, 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 you sort of presumably highlighted the ESG in your opening remarks. So how do you think it manifests itself? Well, I think the truth is at the moment, no one knows still, right? And, and even though there's been a lot of movement in, in, in the right direction, exactly how this plays out into what the future assets of our industry look like, and, and, and you know, to some extent, what, what are the key technological features of those assets? We still don't we still don't know um but i think what is what is positive for our industry is that while this uncertainty remains we are likely to see a continuing reduction in the fleet order book and you know uh, we we've talked here about continue you know the issues of continued oversupply over the, over recent years i mean not even recent years anymore right more than a decade um we, we've seen the negative impacts of that and wondered when that supply demand balance is likely to, to, to get back to an equilibrium. And I think that alongside the changing capital landscape, these technological uncertainties are going to continue to um, ensure that we aren't building vessels that, that will not comply with the, you know, the key objectives of sustainability and environmental requirements in the, in the years beyond um, you know, the, the lifespan of the existing tonnage. And that's likely to see a really interesting um, move in the supply dyna demand dynamic of, 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 the ship, of shipping assets. Um, what is that asset of the future going to look like is the, is the more interesting question, perhaps. And, and like JB said, we don't have a crystal ball to, to be able to say what it looks like. But what I can say is I truly believe we have probably, you know, it will undoubtedly one of the closest uh, examples of a free market that is out there. And if the new technologies that are needed and the new capex investment that is needed for um, supply to meet demand, um, it will come in time, one way or another. Supply or demand will adjust, and and you know if if supply is below demand, the prices will rise, uh, profits will rise, and the and the and the financial model for investing in those capex projects will make sense. Otherwise, demand will adjust because. The increased costs and the increased costs of freight won't warrant the the product being demanded. So I think it's quite you know it's quite an interesting area to debate, but I don't think there's a clear path. Um, and in short, uh, you know I, I think we are we're in for an interesting interesting few years on the on the new build side of things, and and, and in terms of compliance with um, the technological aspects of environmental regulation. And, and, and coming from you, Arthur, you, you raise a six point five trillion dollar price tag. Yeah, the, the yeah. one point sixty five trillion. Um, I totally, you know, echo what, what Stephen just said. Um, coming specifically from the tanker side of things, um, if you do the math and if you consider the trading age of a vessel to be to be twenty years, let's say, you've got fifty five percent of the global fleet, and that's due to be replaced by twenty thirty, and nearly the majority of that. Uh, won't be in operation, you know, by the time 2050 is sort of um, rocks around the, the corner. So I don't think there is a clear solution, but I think we'll need every single one we can get. So the fleet will probably look like an eclectic mix of, you know, ammonia fuel tankers. We've had Euronav that ordered two Suez Max with, uh, with ammonia. 
you've already got some ship owners trialing um, LNG. Methanol as well is coming in the conversation. Um, I think we'll need every single one we, we can get. And at the same time, I think this was raised by the keynote speakers in the in the plenary session just before our, our panel, but financing um, is evolving dramatically. Banks are not willing to, to finance new builds anymore um, unless they're based principles if they've if they've signed to that um unless there's a long-term charter attached as well to to those vessels to make sure they're going to make money um it's rare to see ship owners really put in a lot of money to to commit to that large uh, capex expenditure into a ship which might be obsolete when it comes to to regulations or to the technology um a couple of years down down the line if you look at the the scrubber bet let's call it I think some owners who invested in them probably thought they had 10, 15 years ahead. Um, but the current pandemic has really accelerated that transition and the number of conversations we're having around um, decarbonization. So like Stephen said, as we try to figure all this out, well, the supply of ship is naturally going sort of uh, contract um, and we'll see, we'll see the supply reduced. Thanks very much. Just perhaps go back to JB on, you know, you talked about sort of the, the non-tariff barriers, you talked about Brexit in decreased paperwork just in the UK for now, even though it's a free trade. Do you see more and more of this as, you know, in, you know, in your worldwide business as well from, from other countries? And do you think this is a pattern which is going to just increase over the next few years? And does it prevent you from entering various markets as a result of this non-tariff, this, this additional paperwork, these additional hoops you have to go through? Um. Yes, I, I think that it's a sort of trend at the moment, which is, uh, I mean, I see this as pretty much like it will start, it's swinging in one direction and it still has momentum to go. And at some time, the pendulum will reach its sort of zenith and, and, and return to the other direction. Um, but I, I think that, you know, we see everywhere we work um, increasing barriers to things which aren't. Um, uh, you know, are either barriers created by nationalism, barriers created just by um, a good idea that someone thinks we should implement um, in the civil service, <laughs> or, you know, barriers created by um, you know, purely fiscal desires by government to try to get money out of someone who's not going to win, which tends to be a foreign. Yes. And, and Steve, you know, do you come across this in your business at all? Um, yes, I mean, there were quite a, a few high profile instances of kind of tit for tat trade protection in dry bulk um, over the last 12 or so months. Um, I think people would have enjoyed watching how, how those played out, no doubt. Um, but I think the issue with that is it tends to create um, extreme winners and so it's not productive in the grand scheme of things and, and, and you know, it's often driven by by populist politics right which is unfortunate because i don't think that has a benefit to anybody um there, there are benefits to trade protectionism in the right context right but um you know look we can we would look back as far as the great depression where where where, where it was broadly accepted that trade protectionism really wasn't positive for the broader global economic recovery uh, and, you know, post 2008 global financial crisis, we had all of the G20 representatives really publicizing this message that, that protectionism is not the way to go. It's not the way to, um, to ensure a, a, a strong global recovery. But as JB has moved quite interestingly, right? And undoubtedly, um, well, in my view, undoubtedly with the challenges around um, economic recovery um, obstacles, arising following such a significant quantitative easing program, I feel we're likely to see a bit more of it because, you know, this, uh, the fuel to populist politics is really hardship. And, and that I feel is likely to, to be a significant uh, feature of, of what we're going to see. Um, there are two areas that I really think are going to be quite interesting looking forward on, on protectionism. And that is really whether we see any cracks um, in the countries that have been typical advocates of um, collaboration. It sounds slightly oxymoronic, I guess, for us to be talking about that, having just stepped out of a quite significant collaborative economic institution. But in any case, will we see uh, cracks starting to form 
uh, and 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 maybe we did see one right with uh, with the Europe um, temporarily stepping into um, to interject in the movement of vaccines um, during uh, during the recent um, vaccine rollouts across uh, across Europe and the UK. So those cracks are going to be quite interesting to look out for. And I also think it's going to be quite interesting to see whether there is an ESG agenda that drives trade protectionism. And that could be possible. You know, subsidies is a simple form of trade protectionism. Are we going to see governments stepping in and, 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 and implementing those sorts of subsidies um, in their local geographies? And also, perhaps, will we see the onset of um, uh, tariffs in the form of, you know, more broadly applied carbon credit type discussions uh, that, that are, you know, that, that could evolve as other forms of trade protectionism? So, I mean, it's really interesting. There's, there's no doubt that um, uh, the globalisation of free trade lifts people out of poverty. We've seen that. You know, we've just seen you know, millions and billions coming out of poverty due to trading. And yet we've seen you know, sort of the version of you know, this protection, whatever clothing it's been under. So, as a, Arthur, do you have your thoughts on, on this as well? So, not being directly involved, in the physical trade of goods at Vortexa, it's been interesting because we've been able to sort of take a step back and really look purely at, at the flow. What we're seeing is that even when the world's two largest economy are at odds, someone always steps in, either to, to buy or to sell. Um, the nature of the, of the globalized world today. So trade protectionism, it's hard to it's hard for I'm not a winner really there because you know if everyone decides to to trade between themselves and and leaves you out of the loop, you're going to end up um, hurting your economy uh, a lot more. It's going to be interesting as well to, to see how that's going to play out in the midst of this current pandemic. Uh, Bloomberg estimates the vaccine rollout to take seven years, and though it's likely going to be um, quicker than that, it's going to be an uneven recovery for everyone involved. And it's not just a developed but it's less developed um, economy sort of thing, because Europe is probably going to get there a lot later than Britain or, or Israel at the rate um, this is going. Some countries have fared much better as well, regardless of the size of their, their economy. We can look at countries like, like Vietnam um, or Canada, as opposed to, to the US. So I think all these decisions will have to be balanced in the context um, of A, the, the, the vaccine rollout, and B, the sort of economic uh, recovery as well um, on the path ahead. Um, just to be with the question the panel had, you know, we've talked about protectionism, perhaps our, our aversion to protectionism and trade barriers, but what's your thought if there's limited cabotage perhaps to, to target a particular sector. Is is that worth it in the long run? We've got here to increase here, increasing seafaring numbers and regain UK critical map sustainability. Is there, is there a case for that, do you think? Well, I think that you know, when I was uh, running our offshore business, I thought that the biggest problem that um, people in Britain have is that who wants to go away from their family overnight for a long period of time uh, and have that fly in, you know, uh, that type of life. Um, and I think that, you know, the problem we have in our industry in Britain is, is not the case that uh, we don't have the jobs, but that may, maybe that is a slight issue, but more that the lifestyle that shipping is, is no longer condu conducive to an awful lot of the population. And, and I think that there's no way we can change that. Um, maybe the whole pandemic has enabled people to use Zoom or Teams or whatever to keep in touch more closely with people, and we've moved to another way of relating to people. So being at home at night is not as important. Um, but I, I do see that um, you know how many people willingly would say to their children, "Off you go to sea and don't see your family or kids for four weeks or six weeks or two months." Um, and would recommend that to their family. And, and that's the barrier, I think. Thanks, Jake. And, and Steve, do you think there's any any case for some protectionism or some cabotage, you know, to protect local industry or the like, or, or there isn't there? 
I sympathize with the question because my heart says yes, but my head says no. <laughs> um, no I think that um, where, there, where there is, um, you know, quite clear um, strategic and perhaps even safety and security reasons for implementing protectionist policies like um, cabotage trade, then, um, then you know, there's, there's merit in doing it. Um, you know, I haven't given it a huge deal of thought, but I, I struggle to, to see, you know, on the spot here that there is a, 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 a case, a strong case for arguing it. I think it's more likely that what we've got to accept is that we see benefits of globalization and we see negatives of globalization. And this is one of the negatives that the UK sees right now, and perhaps more of a, a leveling up of the field uh, in time through globalization will change that picture, um, and let's hope it does. Thanks, Steve. Uh, you know, there's a good question from Paul about the proposed UK free ports. So uh, on the one hand, we, we've got out this big trading block and we're trying to remove that. Do you think free ports will have a place? Do you think they've got some potential, Arthur? I, I think they do. I think they do have potential to sort of bring increased business um, to the UK. I think the UK is very well positioned to sort of maintain its status as a maritime power in the in the region. Um, you know, this could be one of the ways to to enhance that in the way of of Brexit. Um, I guess we'll we'll see. Thank you. And, and JB, have you seen sort of examples of free ports around the world, and do, do are they successful at all? Um. I, I think in some cases they've been very successful where it's just been a case of um, doing um, uh, additional manufacturing or fabrication on, on products that have come from somewhere else. Um, you know, I, I think that, that the issue about the Freeport will be is who's at the other, where are you sending the product to from the Freeport? Um, and, you know, I imagine that everything that comes to a UK Freeport will ultimately be destined, or the majority of stuff, be destined for the European Union. Um, and what would be the European Union's reaction to stuff being done in Hull or whatever, value added in Hull, and then sent to the European Union? So um, it seems I don't really quite understand where the recipients sit on stuff coming from pre free ports and particularly the European Union. Um, yeah, I, I've been involved in a few discussions on this subject and, and I, I've kind of concluded that there is quite a significant opportunity there for the UK and, I, and as to the question of what, we, what do I think the impacts of that would be, well I think it could be enormous um, and I think the, cha the, the challenges really are not just about the, um, they, they're important, of course, not, not just about understanding the logistics and, 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 and the, the trade implications of these goods, which I agree with JB, you know, would be primarily destined for the European Union, um, or at least for the mainland, um, is, is how we got the infrastructure here in the UK in place to be able to add value. And, you know, one of the challenges that, 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 that I've been talking um, on, on, on other discussion groups about is, is, is whether, you know, there is enough of a big picture concept um, in mind from the, from the government to consider, A, the available space and land that's needed to develop, um, you know, the, val the value added elements of, of free ports in and around the port itself, uh, and whether there's enough of a commitment and an understanding of what it's going to take to, to build the infrastructure and expertise around it that really brings value from a free port. So I think that, you know, that is a big challenge. I think there's definitely opportunity in it. Um, and, and in terms of how it will be received in Europe, I, yeah, I'm with JB on it. I don't know how that is going to look from a political perspective, but I suspect uh, on a consumer level and per perhaps even on a manufacturing level, um, it has the potential to, to really add some cost saving along the way um, with, uh, I mean, in, in more ways than one, but uh, you know, I think there is potential there for it to be received well by some, but not well by others. Indeed, it, it, so I, could, I could see the perception of it, it, it very important. But this year, the key meetings of the G7 
and also the G20 in terms of the economy. What do you think, how do you think shipping should make its case for sort of world trade and, and perhaps uh, getting rid of protections barriers? What's, what's your thoughts about them? What, what do we need to get on the agenda for, for these, these major developed countries? Arthur, perhaps with you. I think really that cooperation should be should be key. Um, we've seen what a divided world can do, especially when we need it to to be united. Um, trade agreements can increase the flow of goods and services, and as a direct result of that, I think prioritizing the shipping industry um, on government's business agendas to make sure the latter sort of flows uh, seamlessly should be on the top of of that agenda. Whether that's um, addressing some of the concerns spelt out in the the neptune declaration um so the the rights of seafarers their safety amidst the, the current pandemic um is something that should be tackled first and foremost um but simply helping the the ease of doing business um and helping the shipping industry in its core mission which is you know helping countries meet their their energy needs their their consumption needs um i think that should really be at the top of the, the agenda thank you yeah I suppose just on, on, on that as well, what do you see, JB, as the, the sort of the, the outlook now for the next three or four years as we come out of the recovery and, and also looking forward to 2030? And I'll go around to each of you. Do you think there'll be further consolidation of the industry? Will there be or will there be more shipping companies and, and services as, as a result of all the technology changes that we've been talking about? You're on, you're on mute. I think you're on mute. <laughs> I'm trying to think of my answer, doesn't it? <laughs> um, well, I mean, I suppose slightly, I, I, I feel a bit sorry for traditional ship owners like us um, and, and probably everybody listening who's invented, who's invested a lot in historical technology. And, um, you know, and the, and the next set of technology is going to make our technology obsolete. I mean, a bit like these poor people who bought um, Land Rovers or, or diesel cars, and now suddenly they have to get electric cars. So, um, you know, uh, but I do see that, you know, those companies that find their way through that corporals, and I, and I put the whole thing as corporate social responsibility maze, um, those who do will do very well out of it. Um, well, I, I think on the question of whether we'll see more or, or, or less consolidation, I think the simple answer to that is more, um, you know, and I don't think that that's necessarily a bad thing uh, it, for owners and operators. I think, as JB just mentioned, it's going to be um, quite supportive of driving an ESG agenda with scale, of course, and, and, and ensuring um, a leveling up of those standards and, and, and I think that regulation will drive that as well as necessity you know it, from, from investors from end users it's all going to be part of the drivers there and you know in ship management uh, uh, as well um, you know the, the the raft of regulatory changes that that, that come along and, uh, and, and impact our industry they you know more broadly are easily um, more easily digested and rolled out um, consistently through, through larger ship management, and I think that that will be a continuing trend. And Arthur, your thoughts of the future on, on this? I mean, I believe consolidation and um, you know a reduction in number of players is is inherent to any any period of economic difficulties. Um, and once more, we're still very well entrenched in in this global pandemic. Um, at the same time, there is a push towards the the decarbonisation of the industry. Um, but I think I'm going to take the contrarian view here, but I believe there'll be a lot of new players as well, a lot of new innovators that are going to come in. Um, and I think part of the, the old guards, you know, have everything at their disposal to, to be a part of that change as well. And some companies are, are investing a lot um, to be part of that, that change. So if I add, you know, a few of the, the existing players um, and on top of that, a lot of new players that are going to come and, and innovate. I'm actually going to say that there'll be more of us um, down the line than, than fewer. Well, that's interesting. Good to have a country view. I think, uh, you know, we're, we're sort of, the time is ticking away now, and uh, we'll, I'll ask you to maybe a final few thoughts shortly.
But I think what I've certainly seen as a, a, in my role this year is, is almost a disregard for international rules when it suits people. You know, we've seen that in the pandemic with what's happened with the crew when you know, and the, the International Labour Organization actually came out and said that countries have disregarded international law uh, in terms of the populations. We've also seen that sort of that general trend, you know, when, when, when President Trump and with others, with this sort of um, only choosing the international rules when it suits. So what can we do as an industry? Because without global regulation, without global rules, it's exceptionally difficult to trade. What do you think we could do perhaps to try and switch the, uh, to, to encourage leaders to create the, the right frameworks going forward? So I don't know if anybody wants to, to have a shot at that one. I don't mind. Um, I, I think uh, my view on this is there's strength in numbers, right? And that's exactly why we're, we're involved in a forum like this and why we're part of the UK Chamber of Shipping. You know, as an industry, we've got a duty to come together, bring our collective voice without any kind of sector bias or, 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 or um, you know, any kind of political bias and work with the trade bodies that we have to convey what we want and what we feel are the priorities to the, to the decision makers. And, and JB, do you think there's a, a way back to where it was in terms of the international rule-based order? Um, I, I think there is a way back. Um, I, I'm heartened by Stephen's um, comment that strength in numbers. Uh, it, I, I'm forever slightly depressed by the fact that although we collectively, as ship owners, all believe that we should sort the environment out, it's still taking us years and years to collectively decide to do the same thing and in the right direction. And there are people around us who are using that as an opportunity to delay. Um, so I do see a way forward. What I worry about is when is the collective desire to do something that the same thing everywhere going to get together to make a difference? And yeah, I'm going to, to bring up an anecdote. Um, well, it was the first time we, we met Guy um, in the chambers of the, the Baltic Exchange. You were announcing the creation of um, a research and development fund to help, uh, to help the industry um, invest in, in its own future. And, you know, I think to, to use that as a metaphor um, and echoing what Stephen said about the strength in numbers, I think we're extremely lucky as well that there are a lot of people out there that sort of share this common goal. And the difference maybe, you know, compared to the last few years is that they've decided to, to take their future into their own hands um, and come up with the solutions through these forums, um, you know, such as the UK Shipping Conference or, or others, and with the help of organizations such as the International Chamber of Shipping. So I'm pretty positive in that sense. Thank you. Well, we're just about out of time now, so I'm going to go to each of you and just perhaps some, some final thoughts on, on the session. And I mean, it, it's so much to talk about, really, we could go on forever, but uh, uh, we've only got two minutes left. So perhaps we'll, we'll start off with, with you, Steve, your thoughts on what you've heard today and your reflections and how optimistic you are for our industry going forward. Mm. Well, uh, you know, I think the ne for the next few years, uh, I'll speak specifically about the sector that I'm in, perhaps, because I don't think I can talk broadly for all of the, di the different sectors of shipping. But, uh, you know, whether what's um, whether what we're going to see is a stimulus driven re true, true recovery or whether there is some significant underlying economic problem here and we see a, a bump along the bottom, I think for dry bulk, the, we've got a pretty optimistic view. Uh, you know, and, 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 and structured well, uh, you know, we, we hope that we're able to generate reliable um, returns for investors, even in these challenging markets. So I think that, you know, at, at that level, I'm feeling quite positive. Um, it, you know, in terms of some of the challenges that we've talked about today, I think um, some of the key takeaways that, that I've got in mind here are really the, the importance of us coming together through these type of and and using, you know, these opportunities to bring together some of these concerns and issues we've got to, to, to really collect them together and push the messages to the key people. Thanks, Stephen. Maybe your, your final thoughts? Um, I, I, I suppose, I, I, I mean, I, I'm relatively optimistic about where we'll be in the medium term. Um, I, in the short term, 
I, I, I'm just, I think there are going to be a lot of bumps on the road. Um, and that uh, um, we'll have a bunch of shocks. Uh, if anything, 2020 has taught us is the unexpected creates a lot of problems. Um, you know, in our crisis management plan, we had um, a one in 200 year event global pandemic. Well, it turns out that 10 years ago we had SARS. So, you know, what is it in the next five years that's unexpected um, that's going to bump us up? And how many unexpected events has Arthur Rich was talking about earlier, you know. Overall, for the medium term, I, I'm... Thank you, and I'll be your final thoughts. I think we're definitely not out of the woods yet. Um, it's going to, to take some time. Uh, I think what's important is that when we do get out of those woods, we don't return to previous patterns um, of consumption or, or of trade which may have gotten us to, to where we are in the, in the first place. Um, but I also think that, you know, once we're out of the woods, there will be um, sort of a, an unleashment of, of energy and, and consumption there, um, you know, that can really help things uh, move forward. I just thought, Arthur, well, it's time's up now, and it just leads me to say thank you so much to Steve, to, to JB, to Arthur for a fascinating conversation and also once again to thank SPNL for sponsoring this particular session. So on that note, thank you all very much and thank you all for your questions as well and for listening into our thoughts. Thank you all. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you very much, Guy. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Arthur. Cheers. So, appreciate it. Presumably we just moved now, do we? <laughs> 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 All right, cheers everyone. Cheers. Yeah, bye. Thanks, Guy. Yeah, I was just sending a message. Yeah, so if everyone leaves now. Thanks, thanks, Kevin. Cheers.